and I was hot sub and eh, come get him out. And so I was like, I was like, hey, Cole, he came down and sat on the bench after whatever, sat next to me on the bench and he go, I say, hey, Cole, you know, I don't have a lot of opportunities to say this or do this, but you can go, you can go screw yourself. I'll just say that. I said, you can go screw yourself. Hello, everyone. Once again, this is the Ike Max podcast. Thank you guys for being with us today. We were able to interview a very, very, very special guest, our friend to the show, Robert Sacre. Uh, he's a former basketball player here in Japan for Hitachi, fierce competitor, a guy that I really enjoyed competing against on a nightly basis. He brought the best out of me and I always tried my best to bring the best out of him. Uh, he really brought a lot to the game in Japan and it was a, it was a pleasure playing against him. Yeah, definitely a singular personality. Before Japan, he played four seasons for the Los Angeles Lakers and I'm a huge Laker fan, so it was definitely a lot of fun talking to him hearing stories about the Lakers and playing alongside Kobe. Hearing him talk about his experiences in the NBA, his experiences overseas. It is, you know, Rob, he's a big personality. So getting to hear firsthand accounts from him was really awesome to hear those things. And to, for him to talk about how he transitioned from the NBA to overseas now into retirement is really phenomenal. Yeah, he went back to school, uh, got his master's, started a business and has a podcast called Believe in the Zags. If you guys want to take a listen to his podcast please do we'll put the links down below to his social media as well it was an honor and privilege to interview him. hope you guys enjoy we have a special guest on the show robert sacre welcome on what's up man how y'all doing dominant big man how you doing man oh man i'm living the dream man i um i wake up excited for each and every day and it, every day is a new challenge so i look forward to it you played in Japan a couple of years. Um, can you tell us how that came about after you played with the Lakers? So I went from the Lakers and then I did training camp in New Orleans. And then I had plantar fasciitis and I, I tore a ligament in my foot. And so they let me go. And with that being said, I really didn't. I just kind of sat there, rehabbed, and waited for whatever call was my next, my next like route in the world. And Japan Hitachi, they called me first, and I just jumped on board because my last year in LA, I didn't play that much, and all I cared about was just to play. I didn't really care where it was in this world. I just wanted to be able to play and show who I was and who I, what I can do on the court. So um, Hitachi gave me that opportunity and I just seized it. Uh, Ryan Kelly was also on Hitachi as well. Was that uh, maybe the influence your decision to come play over here as well? Or? No, nah, you brought him over, didn't you? Talk to him. Let him know, I Isaac. He brought him, him over, man. Oh, you yeah, brought, him brought him over. Rob was over yeah. here dominating and then he's like, I need a running mate. Oh, my apologies. That's how Kelly got here. Yeah, man, I needed somebody to stretch the floor. So I I hit Ryan up and I asked the team and um right it was it was just it worked out. We were we worked out in LA a lot together. We'd play one on one all the time because we obviously weren't playing that many minutes, especially at the end of our LA careers. And so that being said, I was like, hey, this is a great opportunity and you need to come out here. Japan is where it's at, especially for big men. Uh, Isaac, you know that like it's, it's big sure. man. It's big man heaven over here, you know, sure. and um, that I that gave me the opportunity to show him, hey, man, you come over here. We can play great. And I guess he's leading the league in scoring right now. So I'm happy for him. And I can't I can't ask for anything else. Yeah, He's doing really well, man. But I remember uh, I was with Aishin when they first when Hitachi first signed you. And coach came in, he was like, oh, Tachi's got Sacre. They got Sacre. <laughs> but they got a big man to bang with you inside now. And you know me, like, I, I love the banging. So I'm like, oh, yeah. man, like, this is about to be exciting. Oh, man, dude, I had no idea what I was getting myself in, like, store for. It was, Japan was nothing what I expected in the sense of basketball-wise, where it was as, it's so physical. You can test, you can testify to that. It's the most physical basketball you can think of when it comes to, uh, on the block post basketball, there's everyone has a good big man, and you might not have heard of that one guy, but that guy 
gets buckets somewhere in this, you know, you know, it's crazy. So um, that was one of like, I remember the first game I had was against Nick Fazekas and <laughs> I'll tell I'll tell it like it is. When I saw the film, I was like, this dude is scoring 28 points a game. I'm like, get out of here, bro. That's what everybody says, bro. I know. So I was like, come on, man. What where am I? If this guy is getting 28 points a game, what what where did you guys (laughs) little did I know this guy is a walking bucket? Well, you know, he's so hard to guard. He has, he can shoot from outside and he has a great right hand hook and like he can score from all over the, the, around the basket anywhere. But when I first watched him and I was like, this man can barely get over half court. And you guys are telling me like, he's the best player. I'm like, come on, man. What did I get my, what did I sign up for, man? No, it was the same thing with you though, because the scouting report was like, I don't let him go right. He has a great right hook, great right hook. First play of the game, you catch face up jumper in my face. I'm like, what is this? No, this man, wasn't on the I, scout report. Oh, you damn right it wasn't on the scout <laughs> report. I, I I honed in my craft and I just made sure that like I I wanted to make sure I set the tone early my first season. Okay, this is what who I am. This is what I do, and let everybody else know. Okay, if you're messing with me, you're getting buckets. For sure, but we respected you for it, man. It was awesome. Yeah, I appreciate that, man. I love playing against you. I would, would complain, I should say. I'm not, I should say, uh, I would complain. I'm like, man, this dude is a massive. Like, well, oh, man. But um, at the same time, I, I loved going against you and JR. That was a uh, Twin Towers that I don't think a lot of people understood how great you guys were to play against. I mean, well, you guys definitely bought the best out of us for sure. Oh, we try, man. How did it feel going from uh, being on the bench on the Lakers and maybe not getting as much playing time and showing what you can do to then going to Hitachi and playing, you know, almost a full game every time? Um, you know, I was I can look at my career in Japan or in L.A. And like I played my second year a lot and then my third year I played a lot. And then my last year I didn't play at all really uh, and we sucked and um it was just a lot of drama on and off the court throughout that year and it was depressing i'd be the first one to say i think i was in a depression or something you know and um and i i, I wouldn't say i was in a depression but i was in a slump i should say and i ended up finding like started reading and really started uh, wanting to grow as a person. So uh, when Japan came up, I just wanted to seize this opportunity and really show showcase myself and then showcase what I really, what I can do on the court. And that's what I felt like I needed to do when I got over there. And I, I thought I proved myself. Yeah, for sure. Was there a big adjustment going to Japan? Did you have any friends that lived here or you just kind of got up and left? And uh, You know what's funny? I uh, Ira Brown, I played with two years at uh, Gonzaga. We played together and he was he, he was like a great transition because he was my teammate in, with Hitachi. And um, he really he really helped me, you know, understand the culture and my teammates at the time really helped me adapt with the culture. And ironically enough, my tattoo artist, he married a Japanese gal and moved to Okinawa. So he helped me. He helped me as well. Get uh, some ink over there and enjoy the culture, too. Yeah, man, I tell everybody that Japanese basketball is unlike anything else because I came from Germany to here. And for me, it was a crazy change. Like, I'd never seen basketball play like it is in Japan. It's just so different for me. No, it is. For sure it is. It's, um, you know, I think that it uh, it's so it's a lot structured and it's a lot faster in a lot of ways. You know, the just the the tempo of the game is up and down and it it is a different style, but it, it. you, I think the the thing you got to understand with Japan is like everyone is, is so structured. And then when it comes to games, sometimes it, it, it translates into the games, but the best players and, 
and the best guys over there, especially the Japanese players, they don't play within that structure. And they just like uh, Hijima or, you know, they, those guys just know how to just score. And that's what makes them really efficient over there. Yeah, man. But you look at a guy like you, you went from not playing with the Lakers to being the guy on Hitachi. And that's a big team in Japan. But you seem like you always really wanted that opportunity. Like you excelled at that role. Um, I'm not afraid of anything. I'm not afraid of no man but God. And like, I, I believe that. And whatever challenges come my way, I, I look forward to it. And you got to walk towards the fire to make sure you get through. And so when that challenge came to me, like I said, that first game, I think I put 26 shots up my first game to make <laughs> to set the tone. Like, hey, this is what I'm going to be doing. Let y'all know. Let the whole league know. This is what I'm going to be doing. And there is no bench rob here. That's what I'm just going to set the tone early. What are your thoughts about Rui Hachimura, who's playing really well right now in the NBA and I guess Japanese basketball players overall after you came over here maybe you have um, a different perspective on oh, maybe oh, basketball yeah. in Asia yeah no uh, Masa you want to come say hi yeah. come on man I got a Japanese I got my man over here who played for the club team in Japan say what's up say hi Hi. <laughs> How are you? He's on the mini. He's on the mini Hitachi team right now. He's playing in a border school, uh, a boarding school out in Boston, and he can't he can't go back over into Japan right now because of this whole COVID deal. So he's staying at the crib right now, man. So I think Japan is expanding with basketball, and um, we're just getting we're just getting it's getting better and better. And you can see with Rui being like that transition into the league and. Yeah, more guys, Watanabe is coming into the league that, you know, it, it, the game is expanding. You know what I mean? Yes. Right on, brother. Yeah, but I agree, though. And even the Japanese talent is a lot better than people understand. Like last night, Togashi, the point guard from Chiba, had 40. Dude, he's... he's Dude, they so... had a triple overtime game. He had 40? And you do you remember Mavunga? Yes. He had a 40 he had 47 points, 14 assists and 12 boards, triple double. All right, man. man you need to, you need to come back, Rob. They don't want me back. <laughs> they don't want me back. They, they, the league would be flipped upside down if I came back. That's incredible. Yeah. Which Japanese player impressed you the most while you're playing here? Togashi's up there. Um I, you know, I'm a huge Kawamura fan. I'm not going to lie. Uh, he was with, um, oh man, Yokohama. I was always his, I was one of his biggest fans. Now he might be crazy, but that's what, I, that's what made him. I'll say it right now. I'll say it to his face too. He's crazy, but Hey, he gets buckets. And then when the game, you need a bucket at the end of the game, he'll, he'll make one. So I have, I have ultimate respect for him in that sense, man. Um, there's so many good guys out there. You got Orimo, who's 40 some years old, getting buckets. You know what I mean? Well, yeah, I think crazy. He, he turned 50. <laughs> just, he just <laughs> retired, bro. As he should. I always kept telling him he was older than JR. Could you imagine that? That's yeah. crazy. So the, the, the talent, Leo, I, I was always a huge Leo fan and, um, there's just so many guys over there that I don't think get the respect that they need. But, you know, I think with the league expanding and it's growing, it, the sky's the limit. I think you put a lot of confidence in Leo also because before you got here, he was a known player. But when you guys played together, he improved. and He's still getting better now. Like he's improving no. year over year right now. That's my little brother, man. I was hard on him. I'm not going to lie. I was... I was extremely hard on him because I knew how much talent he has and had like had and has. And so I would always push him and I would, I, and you know what I loved about him? I could yell at him and I could yell at him and, and he would just dust it off and, you know, work to get better. So that's what I, I really loved about playing with him was he always strived to get better. And he knew I would always be the first one in the gym. So if he came in, I would be working with him. Okay. What do we need to do on a pick and roll? This is, we got to work on this like over and over and over. So we both, we understand each other. And like I said, he was a blessing in disguise to be able to play with him. And I, I I'm always forever grateful playing with him. 
I think you were signed to play another year at Hitachi, and then I think you left kind of abruptly uh, going into the season. Uh, what went into your decision to leave early? Man, there were, at the end of the day, I just, it wasn't about money. It wasn't, I really had to just check my ego. And um, I was really just, I found myself not, I was, I love basketball, but I, I wanted to instill something bigger into my kids and be around my kids and uh, me not growing up with my dad always around. I think that really kind of made my decision where is it worth the money and I'm gone from them and, you know, I can't instill the things I want to instill in them or should I play over here for, I could, I could play today if, you know, I could go back over there and still kill, man. But I'd be over there for probably 10 more years. You know what I mean? Because I know how great the league is and how good it's on your body. And and I really just had to make a decision whether what do I want more, you know, and um, I just decided to go the family route. And I, I don't look back. I don't regret any of my decisions. It was just more of a thing where I wanted to. I wanted to be a part of my kids' lives and I wanted to instill something bigger, bigger than me. Yeah, that's a big thing, man, because it gets to a point in everybody's career where it's not just about the money. And I even face that now. I'm 31 now with kids and I'm thinking like, how much, how much longer do I want to be overseas in another country? Is it, when, when is the time to go home and start to put down some roots? Like, what's the plan? No, it's, and you know what? The, the hardest part is just, taking that leap forward and just saying, I'm doing this, you know, for a lot of people, you know, that's for a lot of us, uh, including myself, it's like, you got to ask yourself, okay, I've been doing this my whole life. Uh, what am I supposed to do after this? And that's the scariest part is the unknown. But I think once you take that leap forward, you, you just can't look back. That's why they always say the windshield's bigger than the rear view. So when you're driving, you always look through the windshield. You never look in the rear view because you'll crash. That's a fact, man. I like that. You know, so when you, whatever decision you make, just go with it and ride with it and, you, and everything will fall in its place, but you just have to go with it strong and just, you know, you know don't regret whatever, whatever decisions you make. So after you move back uh I'm, I'm assuming you're in the states yep i'm back in spokane so what do you have going on now so i just ended up finishing my master's at gonzaga so i'm, I'm done that i finished a master's with athletic administration and uh congratulations thank you man oh to be honest with you i'm more confident that i got this than i was any time in my career playing basketball because i, I starting that Starting my master's, I never thought I would finish. So um, to actually go back and finish it, I like I said, I I feel like I can do anything. And um, that being said, I I finished my master's just recently this month or two, last month, and then I started creating my own company, an excavation company, moving dirt. I didn't realize dirt was so lucrative, but everybody, when they build a house, they need that dirt moved from one place to another. I didn't realize this, but hey, it, it's 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 cash. You know, I don't touch anything that doesn't make cash, brother. So I was I got into uh, the excavation building uh uh, business and I'll be talking to Hitachi soon enough, getting some equipment from them. I know that. Um, and I got my podcast, Believe in the Zags, B L B L E A V in the Zags. And um, right now we're second in the Believe Network podcast network. And but that just keeps growing and growing. And I'm just, everything I touch right now, I feel like it, it's going to turn into gold. That's good stuff, man. What's it like turning off that switch? You know, as competitors, we got that switch. Or did you turn it off or did you just take it into now like an entrepreneurship side? That's exactly what it is. You just have to take it into an entrepreneur side. And, you know, um, I, I, I tell people out here in this town, like, hey, best believe I'm, I'm coming for your jobs. Uh, you might not like me, um, but this is what I'm here for. And this is what I'm, I'm, I'm kicking butt and taking names. That's all I know. And so um, I, I know who I want, I want to strive to be like in this town. Um, there are, 
they're the number one construction company out here and that's who I'm striving to be like. And uh, I've, I'll publicly say that to anybody. Um, I'm not afraid to grow. And this is just another learning curve, learning how to run a business and learning. I've been doing dirt work throughout this whole summer, working for a mentor of mine. And he's kind of been my senpai kohai type deal. You know what I mean? So um, I've been, I've been blessed. Like I said, every day I wake up, there's a new challenge and I look forward to that challenge and whatever comes my way, I know I can, I can do it. Did you have like this planned uh, while you're playing or how did that idea come about? Because a lot um, of people, you know, they play basketball and then they think, oh, I'll just worry about uh, the future later after I retire. But no, that's a good question. That's a really good question because like, to be real with you, I, we bought a house here in Spokane, my wife and I, and you know, we did that for one re or a couple reasons. One reason was because this is a great place to raise kids. And then another reason was the networking I met through my college. So with that being said, um, when I came back, I just had a lot, I contacted the, most of the people I knew in town and I was like, Hey, straight up, I don't know what I'm going to do in the future. Um, but, uh, just guide me to whatever, you know, let, tell me what you think I'd be good at, you know, and I would, I'd listen to these people and they kind of just told me, you know, check this out, you know, go, call this person. And like the word got out to eventually where Gonzaga hit me up and uh, they, they asked if I wanted to be a part of uh, uh, athletic development, which is fun, basically fundraising or gift giving. So I was able to be a part of the athletic department here at Gonzaga and finish my master's. And yeah, you know, the money wasn't, the, it, it isn't the same obviously from basketball, but it, it wasn't about that. It's like, okay, I need to take this transition and whatever comes from this, I'll, you know, I'll, I'll figure it out. And I just said, my goal is to just get my master's. Everything else will fall in its place. And throughout March, April, May, around that time, I met someone through Gonzaga, um, a donor through Gonzaga. And uh, he asked, hey, man, do you want to learn the dirt industry? And he's donated a, a, a substantial amount of money to Gonzaga. So I was like, hey, whatever you're doing, I want to know. You know, I'm not afraid to learn. I'm not afraid to grow. Whatever you're doing, you're doing it and you're being successful. So what are you doing that I can follow your footsteps so I can be like you? And he showed me and throughout this whole summer, um, I've been just kind of shadowing him, like literally looking at everything he does, try to mimic, try to figure out, okay, how do I do this? How do I do that? And to the point where I was like, man, um, I'm going to branch off from you and build my own excavation company. And, and that's where it all comes in. And I think everything happens for a reason. You just, I was talking to my coach from Japan about this, Kyle, um, everything happens for a reason. And there's a lesson in everything we get, but you just have to be in the moment to understand what that lesson is. And if you don't, you don't know what the lesson is in that moment, you just have to wait and see because there will be a lesson from everything that happens in your actions. Yeah, for sure, for sure. But bro, competing against you so much, you're one of the most competitive guys I think I've ever met. And I can see it, it's translated off the floor now. I can see the competitiveness coming out in what you're doing. It seems like you took retirement in stride, like you hit the ground running. Oh man, that's what it's all about, baby. You know, like uh, life is full of problems, living life is solving them. So you're, there's not a day in your life where you won't have a problem in your life. So um, it's how you look at it. And like you said, you just, okay, I just pivot from basketball into, let's say dirt work, you know, excavation work. I'm just going to use my my skills and all the discipline that I've learned from basketball and apply it to this. And with that, you just gotta, 
You know, you, you're not going to win every game. You're not going to get every contract. You, that's just what life is all about. But at the same time, if you, you're willing to put your neck out there and, and, and strive to be better and get better, the, the world's your oyster. Yes, sir. You just briefly talked about, like, your skills and discipline that you learned from basketball. Um, I'm wondering what you learned from playing with uh, a lot of Hall of Famers during your time with the Lakers. You played with Kobe, uh, Pau Gasol. Dwight Howard at one point. Um, was there anything that you, you took away from them that maybe you still use to this day? So I can easily first say that Nash and Kobe, they were probably some of the hardest working individuals I've ever played with in my life. And uh, but they they took they took ways of being team leaders differently. And so I, I tried to definitely take the Steve Nash approach on how to handle different teammates. Whereas, but I also tried to take the way Kobe worked and he strived to get better and there was no victim mentality in his mind. And I'm not saying Nash had that mindset, but there was another level when it came to Kobe. And with that being said, I definitely learned so much from all those Hall of Famers and, and not not also just on the court, but off the court, how to be a pro, how to, you know, carry yourself. And, um, you know, I, I, I told people when I was in Japan and I learned this from Kobe, the biggest thing was because I put so many time, so many hours into that one shot or turnaround or a hook shot or whatever it was, I put so many hours into it. I'd rather be one for 50 than one for nine. And that's the realest thing. If I'm going to shoot and I'm going to have a bad shooting night, well, I better, I'm, it's going to be a bad shooting night. Might as well go one for 50. What, what's you the put worst the work I, in though, bro. You exactly. put the work in. I put it in the work. So if it wasn't my night, it wasn't my night. But as long as I know I I, I put the work in, hey, I'm, I'm comfortable to keep shooting. So uh, I think that was the biggest thing I learned from uh, Kobe himself. So can I ask you a question? Do you know where you were when you heard the news? Yeah, I was here at my house. Um, I was upstairs and I remember like I got the text and I was like, man, okay. Like they, they've said Adam Sandler's died like 800 times on like all these hoaxes and all this stuff that's fake. And I just was like, this isn't real. And um, come to find out it was real. And, it, you know, it put things in perspective because – as much as we 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 take things for granted so much and 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 I say that because when Kobe would take the helicopter for a lot of people were like holy he took a helicopter dude that was like him taking the car like he would take helicopters to practice every day that was his thing so like that wasn't something like far out to us to think that he was in a helicopter that was just a normal day for him so when i think about it and it puts it in perspective you never know when your last day is here on earth and so you got to just appreciate everything that you have and um be grateful and 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 that's really what i learned from when he passed away it was just like man you know that's like just getting in the car and going to your kids practice, you know, like that's no different for most people. So uh, it really put things in perspective for me. And it, you, you just, you appreciate things a little bit more. Yeah, I think that's one thing everybody could learn from the Kobe situation is he never skipped a day. He never skipped a step. Like he focused on the process. He loved the process and dedicated us and he dedicated himself to it. And in the end it paid off. I mean, he's one of the best basketball players to ever play. And then even after his career, like you're doing, he was even great in that aspect of things. And I think, uh, so when people talk about Kobe, I remember some guys would go work out with him on the Lakers and they, they obviously they loved it because they got to work out with Kobe, but they hated it at the same time because it was the most monotonous, boring workout you'll ever have. So you'd basically be in the, the gym for an hour shooting the exact same shot 
for an hour just doing like a jab jump shot from the same spot for that whole hour and that was your workout and so to get that mindset of just doing something over and over for a lot of people you just you start tuning out and you start zoning out and everything and it's hard to stay that locked in but that was a workout for him just to shoot that one specific shot for an hour and uh you you learn that discipline and that's what made him that that's what really differentiated him from other guys i agree with that what's the funniest moment you've had with them is there like a funny moment because he, everybody thinks he's so serious all the time i guess uh so i always tell this story and i don't know if you i'm not gonna cuss on your show but uh so we were playing dallas and we were playing dallas and um we uh we were at a free throw and i think there was like five seconds left and i can't remember if it was going into the second quarter or going into the half i think it was going into the second quarter and so he's like hey sack i need you to inbound this ball real quick i'm like all right man i got you so they made the free throw i run in and he does this like quick like like juke and like like he went one way, then like wait, you just went all over the place. And I passed it to Jay Crowder. And like Jay Crowder basically had a layup and one on me. Like, and I was hot sub, eh, come get him out. And so I was like, I was like, hey, Cole. He came down and sat on the bench after whatever, sat next to me on the bench. And he goes, I say, hey, Cole. You know, I don't have a lot of opportunities to say this or do this, but you can go, you can go screw yourself. I'll just say that. I said, you can go screw yourself. And he knew he was in the wrong because he knew he juked the wrong way. And so he just tapped me on the shoulders and laughed when we laughed about it. But I said, I don't get to do this often, but you can go screw yourself. So <laughs> that, that, that was my, uh, my, one of my funny Kobe stories. See, then that's funny because people have to know you to understand that because even if it was your first or second year, you weren't afraid to say that to him. That's the thing no. about it. No, I wasn't afraid to say nothing. Was, Come on, old man, you know, like, what's up, old man? Like, and I love poking that bear. I told him in practice I never wanted to play on his team because then I it was always su- it was sweet honey to beat him every time in practice. That was my goal. Now I didn't get a lot of wins all the time, but hey, when I did, I let him know. Sure. You were there uh during his last game. Mm-hmm. What was that environment like before the game, during, and then afterwards? A surreal moment. You know, you're part of history. Um, you're just a part of greatness. And even like you said, you know, you, it's hard to really kind of explain that that day, and like it, it still seems surreal to me. Um, just being able to say I played with him for four years, I I think about that all the time. Like, wow, man, what a what a great time. So um, that being said, I just it was a surreal moment. I think everybody from LA or you know basketball fans in general were watching that game. So I was just I wonder what the locker room was like before the game. Was everybody kind of like nervous because it was the last it game? It was our last game, man. <laughs> we were we were trash that season. So we were at the same time we wanted to get done too. Like we like I'll be real with you. We were terrible. I don't I think we set the record for worst most losses in in franchise history. So guys wanted to go back to wherever they came from and just get over this season, you know, but at the same time, you knew you were also a part of, you know, something that it was something spectacular, like the Kobe, we were, we were a part of the whole going around the, the country playing. And it was like his last hurrah. So every venue was sold out, you know, and um, you the amount of fans I've never seen so many grown ass men cry in my life until I see like until I was a part of that because you'd see 40 and 50 year olds crying and you're like man 
if you knew what this guy was just really like, you know what I mean? So it was kind of, it was a, it was a surreal moment to be a part of that. I think the going back and watching that game, the thing that impressed me the most was at that age, he put up 50 shots that night, dude. 50. Oh, no. You that like, might... we played basketball a long time. Putting up 50 shots is hard, man. It's it, and he would always say that, like when he 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 talked about um, averaging was it fifty that one that one month or something? It was something incredible where he was averaging like a stupid amount of points, and that was his MVP or should have been his MVP year. But anyways, um, he talked about there's a certain kind of conditioning that you need that uh, requires you to be able to shoot that much. And um, you really have to work at, you have to work your body out to be able to shoot that much. And I don't think people really understand what comes with that. Yeah, that's tough because, you know, playing in Japan, once you get, once you get hot, it's double teams coming now, sometimes triple teams coming. So getting up, getting up 50, getting up 30 shots is hard, man. He shot a lot of double double and triple teamed. Tell me about it. Tell I know you it. know the feeling. Oh, you already know. I was getting buckets. I was getting buckets. I was looking forward to the double team, man. Yeah, I see. I think that's what made you develop your mid range like that. Because for me, you know, I'm a true big, so I get double. I got to split double teams and shoot contested. You started shooting fallaways. No, man, that was the that was the thing. Like I knew I had that shot in me, and I just really never let it. Uh, I never really let it go in the NBA. And that was part of the thing too. I said to people like, Hey, defense is what got me in defense is what got me over here to Japan. I'm done playing defense. I'm just looking to get buckets over here. (laughs) Not mad at that. During your time with the Lakers, you were kind of known to be the dancer on the team. When someone makes, I was excited, man. Yeah. Yeah. Did you get that from Roni Turiaf or was that always kind of in your personality to do so? That's the, that was always in my per. Now I did learn from Roni. Um, Roni was down in LA. He played for the Clippers and he's like a big brother to me. And I've learned a lot from him, but um, for me, it was more of just staying engaged with the game. There's so many superstars coming at the game and, you know, you'll see Denzel or you see the lead singer of kiss or, you know, Leonardo DiCaprio, you'll see all these famous people. So you kind of get, you know, sidetracked and oh who's that you know blah 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 anyways long story short you the game is still going on you you got to play you got to be locked in some way you might have to get your name called so for me it was just to keep me stimulated i'm i'm a guy who can't sit still i'll, I'll be the first one to tell you all that and um i I just had to, I just had to stay engaged that way. And that was my way of staying engaged and staying focused into the game. And it, it, it became something. You cheered on your teammates every time they, they did well on the court, even though you were maybe playing at the time. Um, but some people maybe think that's, you know, they're too cool for that to kind of show that exuberance on the bench. Um, what do you think about that? I mean, that's where you got to check your ego. You know, like, what do you want? You want to win or do you want to be a part? And and I think being a part of some really good college teams and, um, you know, being a part of, I would say, some pretty good Jap- uh, B-League teams. Um, and then looking back and, and playing with, not everyone wants you to succeed, but if – if everyone wins, we all win. And that's how it really needs to be. And like, I don't, I don't think people realize if you're on a team setting, Hey, you know, Quinn cook, he didn't play that much for the golden, uh, golden state warriors, but you know, he was that raw, raw guy. He did come in for five minutes here and there and yeah, they won a championship. Now look at him, you know, he's playing for the Lakers and he's a great example of like you, if you're a part of a winning team, you're going to be successful later on in your career. And so you want everyone to succeed. And I think that's um, 
my mindset for everybody. I don't care. I want this podcast that I'm on right now. I want you guys to be the biggest podcast in Japan. That's why I'm here. You know, that's we appreciate, you know, we appreciate that. That you know, I'll be straight up and honest. I think it's all about sharing the love, and if we can all share the love, that's we can make this world a better place. But my thing is, you went from that to Japan, and you know how Japan is like tattoos aren't really common here. Big personalities aren't really common here. And you went to a company team like Hitachi and they loved you. Like they loved you for that side of you. How how was that feeling? Because I'm not gonna fake who I am, man. I said that's the real deal. I'm I know who I am. I'm proud of being who I am. Now, if you like me, you like me. If you don't, you don't. It's not my problem. And you know what? We just became, we just had a great bond. Hitachi and I, we just, we connected. I'm very grateful to what all they have done for me and my family. And I, I forever on, I'm indebted to them. So I can always say that. But I, at the same time, this is who I am. And if you sign me, this is what you're going to get. I remember the first game we played against you guys. We get done with the warm up. You take your shirt off, tattoos hanging out, and put on the game. Let them all know, man. I give it. I'm ready to rock. Absolutely, I'm giving the ladies what they paid for, man. (laughs) You know, I'm not not gonna. I'm not gonna deny these ladies. I'm thinking to myself, this dude's got a thousand percent confidence. I got to come with it tonight. I got to break. Uh, yeah, uh, you're a biblical man, Isaac. Hey, for he who thinketh in his heart, so is he, brother. Okay, okay. <laughs> you know, I'm the real deal. I believe in myself. I just, I, I walk with confidence and I say, hey, God only made one blueprint of me. You know why? Because I couldn't handle the competition, brother. <laughs> uh, to go back to kind of the beginning of our conversation, I think you said maybe you're a little bit mentally down um, at the end of your MBA career. Um, and then you said you went into books. What kind of books did you read? And is there one that I guess you would recommend to people? Um, yeah, one of the books I got into, the first book I opened up and it really changed my life was The Power of the Now. And um, I remember the, the thing about LA was we sucked. I'll be the first one to tell you that. Um, I wasn't playing. And we were doing 17s and suicides with a, a week left in the season. So I'm asking myself, what? whoa, I haven't done this much running in, since not even high school. So what am I doing right now? Like, do I really love this game? You know, like this is crazy. But at the same time, uh, so I just was like, I can't be wasting my time. Um, I can't be wasting my, I got to grow somehow. If I'm not growing on the court, I got to grow somehow. So I got into this book called The Power of the Now. And it really helped me uh, center myself in the sense of, it talks about most of our anxiety comes from thinking about the future. Oh, I got to do this. I got to pay this bill. I got to do this. I got to, man, oh, you know, we're always focused on the future. And, and most of our depression comes from thinking about the past. Oh, I should have done this. I shouldn't have said that, blah, 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 blah. All these what ifs and, you know, but if you're in the moment and then you're in the true moment, that is when you find your great, greatest happiness. And I don't think a lot of us find that. And, um, and it's hard to find that because we're, we're so distracted with what's going on in the world and blah, 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 that if you can just in, engage in being in that moment, that's going to change your life dramatically. And, and throughout my time in Japan, I really started reading and then I just started asking myself, okay, what am I really doing this game for? Am I playing because I want to, you know, am I playing because of my ego and I want to just feed that? Or do I want to play because, or, you know, I want to put food on the table? Or, or is there something bigger for me? And for me, it was being with my kids and instilling something bigger. And that's where it all kind of spiraled into that. Yeah, you're the perfect guy to start a podcast. What made you go off into that sector? What made you want to do it? Uh, so I took broadcasting in uh, college. I minored in broadcasting. And so every summer I would come back here for the country radio show, uh, 99.9 Coyote Country. 
and I would do Wabbit Wednesdays every Wednesday from every summer. I mean, since I graduated from college, I would always go on that coyote country and they're the number one radio show in Spokane. And I ended up realizing I'm pretty, I'm pretty good at this, you know? So I tried to, I tried to, I didn't know, you know, my path. And I was thinking about trying to be a DJ, but I, I was talking with those fellas and they were saying that's kind of a, that industry is kind of dying being on the radio, but podcasts are out there. And um, like I said, everything happens for a reason. An um, old buddy of mine from college that I hadn't talked to in probably eight, 10 years, he just randomly hit me up out of nowhere and was like, Hey, Believe has uh, Believe Network. They want to start a podcast with you. Are you? Would you be down to do it? I'm like, absolutely. I'll never say no. And I, since then, we've been we've been either two or three uh, top podcasts on the Believe Network, and we just are striving. And you know, I'm proud of that. Saying that they've have three to four hundred different types of podcasts, and we're two and three up there. That goes to show what our work pays off. It's good stuff, man. And so when checking out your podcast, what can the fans in Japan here expect from you guys? Oh, man. Just uh, wild stories of college that I'm not proud of and things I'm not proud of my life, but I'll I'll engage. I'll definitely engage. <laughs> I know you and I know there's tons of entertainment. <laughs> oh, man, buddy. Up there I for everybody. Stop. Oh, it's something for everybody. I'm, 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 like I said, I'm an open book. You're, if you ask me anything, I'm not afraid to tell you, man. I'm human. All right. Uh, we're going to get into the Mount Rushmore section of the podcast. Okay. So I'd like to know your top four of um, a certain topic. So top four Japanese foods. Uh, does yakiniku in, in general count as one? Yeah, we can count that. We'll, we'll okay, that. okay, I'll say yaki niku mixed with a nomi hodai, all combined together, so I can get my <laughs> beer and my beef. Okay, so for people who don't know nomi hodai, that's all you can drink as well. Yeah, yeah exactly. It's all you can drink too. So and make that uh, ni onegashimas. You know, <laughs> make that two beers. <laughs> so um, I would do that. Um, oh, uh, for sure. Just your little hole in the wall ramen spot. That's usually your best best ramen you can get. You know, uh, for sure ramen. What type um, of broth, dude? I remember it just had pork. yeah pork. You had the little pork like, and then you could put like what little pork fat in there too. Right, right. Yep. Oh yeah, man. <laughs> um, Yoshinoya, that was my spot in the middle. It's a clutch clutch spot. You got to have that. Yep, yep. And then, um, you know what? Uh, Probably some Japanese curry. I haven't had curry. um, I haven't had good curry since I've been back home, and I'm actually, like, fiending for some curry. I mean, you're more than welcome to come visit me, man. No, you don't want me over there. (laughs) Japan doesn't want me over there, man. I love to have you out for a few weeks. Oh man, they, they, with you. The, the country would the country would know what to do. <laughs> okay, so I want to ask you, what do you miss most about Japan or like Japanese basketball in general? Oh man, I miss I miss my teammates. I miss uh, I I miss playing. Obviously, I'm like I said, I'm a competitor, but at the same time, I miss uh, being on the court. Just and I I miss the culture. Uh, there's so much I miss about Japan. Like, hey, I can't, I can't really put one finger on it. Like, um, just the way they value honor and respect. You know, you, we really, we don't really have that too much over here anymore. So it's, it's kind of cool to see that, um, and just just being part of something special, which was the B league, you know, the B league was growing when I was over there and um, it was just developing and becoming bigger and bigger. So to say I was a part of that and the growth of the B league, I'm, I'm proud to say something like, Hey, I did something. Well, coming from a former competitor of yours and a guy who played against you in the post a lot, man, we miss having you over here, man. Like you were, you were really, really fun to compete against dude. We have some great memories and, Just appreciate everything you brought to the Japanese game, my brother. 
Oh man, nothing but love, brother. Hey, same to you. I trust me. I cussed you out the whole and you hey, and you know what was funny? Um, one of my best friends is Abdullah Kuso, and he plays for uh the robots, right? And uh I told him he called me the week before he was playing you, and I was like, Hey, does he still have that free? Have you been watching film? Does he still have that free throw? If he does, let me hey tell him, tell him he needs to be working on them free throws. And <laughs> I was I was telling him that he's like, man, I'm not trying to get killed by Isaac. I said, no, forget that. He's a nice dude. You just got to talk crazy trash to that dude. Forget whatever. He's a good dude, man. He ain't gonna hurt you. Hey man, like the first game I played against him, I catch it on the post and I'm like, hey, I'm just going to go at him one time as hard as I can. So I like <laughs> power dribble, like shoulder in and I hook shot. And he's like, man, this dude's like strong. <laughs> and like, hey, you said that, but dude, I'm thinking in my mind, like, hey, I got to expand my game. I can't keep doing that. I almost broke my shoulder, man. <laughs> I was like, damn, we just trying to, you trying to hurt me? Damn, this is... You're one of those dudes you can't you can't fight. You just gotta shoot them. You just <laughs> there's no hand to hand combat. We're just gonna take some hey, to dude, your head, it, boy. Dude, it hurts so bad. I'm thinking, man, I gotta expand my game. I can't keep playing like this. Like it was so painful. Now I don't miss. I'll be the first one to tell you. I don't miss the back to backs and the six and noon games. I don't miss those at all. I don't miss that at all. Like that was brutal. I, I remember always complaining on the second game, like, oh, my body, I don't know if I'm going to be able to get through this game, y'all. That was, uh, that was, that's the biggest struggle I could say the B League was for me. It was like the back to backs, weekend games, and it's like, and you didn't even have 24 hours in between games. For sure. But you come from like the NBA schedule, so I'm assuming it was actually easier than NBA. No, because we, we, we when we have back to backs, you wouldn't play until like you might fly into a city at three in the morning, but you're you you do a little walk through in in the morning at like noon, and you call that morning, and then you go back to sleep for the next six hours or whatever until game time, basically, and and that was your kind of routine on a back to back. But in Japan. You play that seven o'clock or six o'clock game, and then you have that noon game, boy. You're, and comes then you play. It comes so fast, and then you can't go to sleep on those Saturday nights because you're already jacked up. Your adrenaline's pumping, so you, you don't fall asleep until about one, two o'clock, okay. and then and then you wake up for your team meeting at ten. And then there's no nap in between. And knowing then you're going to play 40 minutes. Knowing you're going to play 40 minutes. And then you're just like, oh, man, I'm going to need like two coffees for this game. Because <laughs> and your body is bruised already from the first game because you, you went against butts or, or some – ginormous like a josh smith or somebody that doesn't make sense you know <laughs> and, like, and then you're like oh man i gotta go against this guy at noon oh i'm still recovering from last game i agree 1000 <laughs> percent stuff man they, they, they're killing us this year we play friday night seven saturday morning one i'm like dude come on man oh that. man that's the struggle for it's real brutal, bro yeah, that is brutal, man. But hey, you're doing it, man. You be proud of yourself. You you've had a phenomenal career, and like I like I said, I'm proud to say I played against you. And I, I tell people all the time, man. Like, hey, like, there are some giants over there in Japan. Don't get it twisted. There's some giants over there. No, man, you one of the best guys I ever played against. I love I love the games because I know you're gonna keep it fun. You're gonna keep it competitive, and you're going to talk the whole game. I, I, all I do is, uh, you know, I, uh, I, I just, I keep it 100 and keep it fun, man. Hey, to be real, man, we're playing a game. So if we can't enjoy what we in, uh, we're we doing, then what's the point of doing it? That's what I'm all about. I swear this dude, like, against me, he was turning over right shoulder, turning over left shoulder, shooting mid ranges. I'm like, man, who, who is this? How You're would you shoot threes. like this? Rob, yeah. oh. you know, extended out to threes, right? Hit everything. Damn right, I did. I just yeah, my, people I was, don't know I, that. LA fans don't know that, but yeah, he was showing you know, up. All right, man, there's always time to expand and grow, baby. You're never too old. No dog is too old to learn new tricks. I agree with that. Is there anyone that you could recommend to get on the podcast? 
what over in Japan or anything. I'll just try to reach out. Who do you suggest for us? Let's see. We, what Does you not need to be basketball. Get? No, it needs to be GJ Valerino. GJ from Appalachian oh, State. GJ, what? Oh my goodness. <laughs> oh my goodness. Where is he, bro? I have no idea. I always just like to bring that name up with you. I have no idea. He just he was I played with him and then he transferred to Appalachian State and played with that. Yeah, no. Um, yeah, you know what? Like I say to people when it comes to building your podcast, as long as you're consistent, it will grow. And that's what I've learned through this whole process of building my podcast was, hey, not everyone's going to agree. You can't you can't appease to everybody. But as long as you're willing to just do it consistently and have that consistent uh, uh, daily or weekly episode, it will grow. And, and over time, you're going to get bigger and bigger, bigger um, guests on. And that's what I've learned. So thanks a lot, bro. Is there anything last thing that you want to plug in? Oh man, water the bamboo. I I learned that from Japan too, man. Water the bamboo, and I live by that. I got it tattooed on my wrist. I, it it's a metaphor. It's like um, so what the Japanese do. They'll plant bamboo, and for three years they'll water it, water it, water it, water it, and never see it grow. But that's the same in anything in life. You just keep constantly doing something and you just water water your water water and in the fourth year that bamboo shoot will grow six to eight feet in three months so the whole the whole metaphor of that is as long you might not see progression when you're watering it but over time you'll see tremendous growth so just keep watering the bamboo fellas for sure for sure all right and so tell the people where they can find your podcast uh, any anywhere you get your podcast, um, just put in "believe in the zags," and I repeat that B L E A V in the zags, and you can you can hear me and Jack. God, just bless us all, bless us all, because <laughs> I, I don't know. We go off the we go we don't really talk about much zag stuff, and if we do, it's college college stories. All right, and man, I know you're going to send us over some of those hoodies, right? You want, man, you like these joints? These Let's, are, I'm waiting on I'll that. send you one, baby. Right, nice. We need those, man. We need I'll send those. you, I got you. Dude, I, I got, got you. The clothing line. I'm like, man, that's nice. No, I got my tattoo artist to draw me on my logo. And um, yeah, I, 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 everything I put in, like I got the flowers representing, you know, I got the flowers representing doing all landscape for people. Hey, dirt represents money in my eyes, and I'm the king of Spokane. So that's how that that that's what it all represents, baby. I love it. Yeah, I think uh, all your fans uh, from this podcast learned a lot, and I think everybody's gonna support you in your next career. And um, I think me and Ike as well. Uh, we learned a lot from you, so we appreciate your time. Oh, anytime, guys. And like you said, if you guys ever want me back on the show, I have. Let me know, like. I, I gave me a good two week notice. I appreciate that, <laughs> fella. So I could make sure I had some strong coffee for today. I appreciate and, you, man. I appreciate no worries, you. man. Like I said, it's all about the love. And if you guys ever need me back on the show, I'm here and, and just give me a holler. For sure, brother. All right. So once again, this has been the uh, Ike Max experience. Thank you guys for watching us. Uh, please like, comment, and subscribe. And Rob, man, really appreciate you being here, brother. Really, really thanks for taking the time. Thanks, Anytime, man. Anytime, baby. Right on. 日本の方、最後までご視聴いただきありがとうございます。チャンネル登録、高評価よろしくお願いします。